Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and I'm here today at the Rock Island Auction Company, where we are taking a look at the last version of the Lee Enfield rifle to be introduced into modern active combat service. This is an L42A1 sniper rifle. And these were introduced in 1970, but most of them were actually manufactured in the 1940s. And the reason for that is that they were all actually converted from pre-existing number 4 Mark 1T World War II base pattern uh, Lee Enfield sniper rifles. So uh, the British adopted the FAL, or as they would call it, the SLR, the self-loading rifle, in 7.62 NATO. But the FAL wasn't really that good of a sniper rifle. Um, you would expect when the British Army adopts a new rifle they're going to make a marksman's version of it. Well, nobody, not the British or anyone else, really succeeded in making a good marksman or sniper rifle out of the FAL. It just didn't have the mechanical accuracy for it. So the British military kept its Lee Enfield bolt-action sniper rifles, and interestingly it actually kept them in 303, even though when 7.62 NATO was adopted things like the Bren gun uh, were, all the Bren guns were converted into 7.62, uh, the 303 Vickers guns were replaced with 7.62, I believe FN mag machine guns, but the Lee Enfield sniper just kind of soldiered on in 303 until 1970, and that's when this was adopted. Now, you might find it curious that the British didn't ever actually convert their existing stocks of number 4 Enfield rifles to 308. We know the Indian uh, government, the Indian military, did uh, convert their production, in fact, of SMLEs over to 308 or 7.62 NATO. The British never did. Uh, they did tinker with it, they experimented, they were unable to get any really successful um, conversion process. Apparently there were problems with private companies coming up with ideas and then patenting some of the, the the aspects of those conversions, and that led to some legal potential legal problems with conversions. Um, there, the the early attempts to make a 7.62 sniper rifle out of the Lee Enfield didn't fare very well in official government testing. Uh, they were actually kind of outshot by open sighted 303 rifles. You know, scoped 308s were less accurate than the open sighted 303s in some cases. At any rate, it just never really worked out. And what's kind of cool is. In this situation it was actually the civilian shooters in Great Britain that were pivotally responsible for the development of this rifle. There were some competition shooters who also of course had this not, you know, not particularly creative idea to let's use a, an Enfield action and make a 308 rifle out of it. But they figured out how to do it right. They put, uh, they cut down the stocks, they put heavy barrels on them, they tuned them up, and they made fantastically excellent competition rifles out of them, and the military took note. And the military actually in cooperation with the British NRA, which I should point out is not the same as the American NRA, they're, they're both the National Rifle Associations, but the two organizations are very much different from each other and not connected. At any rate, the British NRA was actually uh, essential in the process of developing this rifle. So in 1970 the British would uh, they would finish up some of their testing and they would adopt this as the L42A1. So let's take a look at what they changed, because a lot of the stuff on here is still World War II era. So things that were changed on the rifle. First off, the, the action was converted from the rimmed 303 cartridge to the rimless 308 or 762 NATO cartridge. So the magazine uh, profile and shape changed, and that's pretty distinctive down there. And then there were some minor other changes, like the extractor and the ejector, were changed uh, just to suit the new cartridge. So for example, I don't know if we can see it through there, yeah you can't see it through there, but for example there used to be an extractor uh, or an ejector screw on the outside of the receiver, that's no longer in place on the L42 because in 7.62 NATO it doesn't need it. The cheek riser of the original uh, number 4T was kept. The stock and the handguard were both cut down, and these are actually free floated on the barrel, and uh, and a heavy barrel has been fitted. So this is a 27 and a half inch heavy barrel. Um, it brings the rifle weight up to 12 and a half pounds, which is about a pound heavier than the number four sniper rifle, um, about a half a kilo heavier than the number four. Kind of interestingly, the original number four front sight and front sight protector wings were actually kept. In fact, they had to turn down the very end of the barrel. You can see this is a little smaller diameter than this. They had to turn down the barrel so that they could fit uh, those that front sight assembly onto what was a much heavier barrel than the original rifles had used. 
and the nomenclature changed. So these are now marked uh, L42A1 and, uh, and D71. I believe that's a 1971 manufactured date on this one. However, because these were converted from existing sniper rifles, you'll also find all the markings that would have originally been on a number 4 Mark 1T. For example, we have the TR stamp right here, which goes all the way back to when this was a standard number 4 rifle, and uh, was found to be of particularly good accuracy, and thus uh, eligible to be converted into a sniper rifle. We have M47C, which is still the manufacturing code for BSA, and then 1945 production date there, and the original rifle serial number, uh, R39800. If you watched the uh, number 4 sniper video you'll know that that T stamp, which is only about half surviving there, next to what used to be the ejector screw, uh, that T stamp was the final approval stamp uh, for the number 4 Mark 1 T. Now this scope base has been reused, so it had a serial number here that has been lined out and replaced with the serial number of the rifle that it's currently on. And we have the numbering of the actual scope rings. So as with the number 4, uh, these numbers don't indicate anything except you want, in this case, A295 to match 295, A296 to match 296. Uh, so that you keep track, if you take this all apart, you know which ring went on the rear and which went on the front. The scopes remained the same. They continued to use number 32 Mark III uh, telescopic sights, and you can see that designation right here, it's a little tough to read because it's also been lined out. Uh, the serial number and the production date of the scope do survive. So it's serial number 28111, made in 1945. And they have remarked it here on the opposite side of the scope with its new designation, because they made a couple of little changes to the scopes. So they improved the waterproofing seals, and they also changed the range adjustment from yards to meters. And after doing that they redesignated the new scope L1A1, right there. So the serial number is actually stamped twice, because the original serial number was kept. They just put a new designation and catalog number. Take a look at the elevation adjustment dial, and you'll notice a nice big M. That's to remind you, in case you forget, that this has been changed from yards to meters. Uh, however, the adjustments remain the same. So 50 meter increments from zero out to a thousand meters. The windage dial uh, also remained the same. It's, it remains one minute of angle uh, clicks left and right. In total, uh, 1,080 of these rifles were converted over to the L42A1 pattern, and they would serve in the British Army until 1992, when they were replaced with the L96A1, which was a bolt-action uh, sniper rifle made by Accuracy International, a, a proper modern sniper rifle with all the modern accoutrements that we would expect. Um, however, that leaves the uh, the L42 as one of the longest serving military sniper rifles. I mean, the Lee Enfield system was first introduced by the British before 1900, and here it is, not fully declared obsolete until 1992. It's not the longest serving example, but I think it's one of the best examples of an early bolt action system remaining in frontline major military use for basically a hundred years. So. Um, what's kind of cool is when these were declared obsolete, they were a lot of them were sold on the commercial market, and in fact a huge batch of them, well, relatively speaking, I think about six or seven hundred, uh, were purchased by Navy Arms, a guy named Val Forget, and a lot of those came into the United States. So there are, well, these aren't common rifles. They are not uh, incredibly difficult to find rifles. Now this is a particularly nice example that shows all the the really cool World War II to to modern day progression. Uh, and if you'd like to see more information on this, specifically uh, Rock Island's detailed pictures, their description, their value estimate, uh, a lot of people are interested in those, uh, you can take a look at their catalog page for the rifle. You can get there by way of Forgotten Weapons linked in the description text below. And uh, that should probably provide you any other information you'd like to have. Thanks for watching.